You can be seated. So, all right, so we are on our second message here about finding hope. And, uh, and we are looking at finding hope when you're hurting. So I, I want to open up with this question. When you're hurting, generally speaking, how do you cope with that? How do you cope with hurting? I think there's a, a variety of ways that we sometimes try to handle our hurts and our struggles. Um, sometimes, one of the things we do is we try to distract ourselves, right? This is, this is one for me that I totally fall into. Like, I just get busy with stuff. I start, you know, doing more reading or doing more projects or um, just dawdling on the internet doing nothing, right? Because I, I feel overwhelmed or I feel anxious. And so, um, we, can, we can try to distract ourselves. Sometimes the way we distract ourselves is by uh, so looking forward to something, right? So like things are really hard, but vacation's just around the corner, and I'm holding out for hope that that's going to be great. Um, so we'll, we'll look forward to something. Sometimes we try to minimize our pain by considering other people who are suffering greater than we are, right? So we go, well, I, you know, I, I am hurting, but at least I'm not as bad off as so-and-so, right? So we kind of push that down. Sometimes one of the ways we deal with pain is just to kind of spiral out of control, right? Maybe it's throwing temper tantrums, getting angry, or despondent withdrawal. Um, there's lots of ways in, in that regard that we can uh, end up feeling very hopeless when we're struggling. Sometimes we try to be positive. Have you ever run into the people who are being positive? Right? Um, we believe that things will get better if we're just positive about it. Now, being positive can be beneficial, and it can kind of help change your perspective, which could be helpful. Uh, but this is something critical that I think is important to point out. You can't have hope in hope. Your hope needs to be in someone or something, right? It's like being thankful for thankfulness, or I don't know, it's, it's weird, right? To hope in hope. So just being optimistic or being, I'm going to be a hopeful person, in what? Right? It's got to be in something. You have to find hope in something or someone. Sometimes we, uh, we, we deal with the struggles, our hurts, and, and coping by, by prayer, Right? And that's, that's a good place to go. Um, to ask God to intervene, to, to move. And, and, but oftentimes, what we're really asking for is, God, get me out of this pain. Right? This hurts. I don't like this. Take it all away. Abracadabra. And we're hoping that God will just wipe something off the slate. Well, Paul has some important words for us to consider on this topic of suffering and struggling and pain. And, uh, and as we talk about that, I, I want to remind you of the Apostle Paul's uh, life story because he's not coming at this subject from a place of naivety here, right? Paul has been through a lot. And, and if you just go back to the very beginning of his story, not his birth because that's not recorded in Scripture, um, but where Paul first shows up is in the book of Acts, and he's actually a part of persecuting Christians. So the apostles have begun to go out and, and proclaim the good news of what Jesus has done, and the people are getting saved, and this has got to be stopped. So the Pharisees are in full stop-it mode. And, uh, and one of the people that is preaching very powerfully is Stephen. Stephen is, uh, is proclaiming God, and, and because he's not lining up with Judaism, um, he is going to be stoned. And Paul is there, a young Paul, as a Pharisee, he's there holding the coats of all the men who have lined up to stone Stephen. So he's an accomplice. And it seems to trigger something in Paul, because Paul, from that point forward, becomes a very... Um, passionate persecutor of Christians. He is a professional at it. He is going around jailing them and killing them at every turn, at every opportunity. And he even has expressed permission to go other places to hunt for Christians and get them. And uh, in the midst of that, Christ appears to, to him and asks Paul, why are you, why are you hurting me? And Paul is perplexed and overwhelmed 
and confused, but he has a miraculous come to Jesus moment when Jesus came to him. And then he came to Jesus. Right? And, uh, and then something begins to set in. I, I think it has to set in. Right? He's been murdering and persecuting Christians. Now he is a Christian and he's suffering the regret of his past mistakes. It would have to be. So that's one of the things we can suffer. It's regret of our past mistakes. Maybe that's something you still wrestle with. When, when Paul is saved, the Christians were understandably slow to trust him. Right? Despite his vast knowledge of the Old Testament and now his new zeal for Christ, Paul faced a lot of rejection from fellow believers. And maybe you face skepticism early in your faith. Where people are like, yeah, we'll see. I don't know, this is not going to stick. It can be tough. After a period where Paul is discipled and he begins to grow and begins to uh, have a little humility and, uh, and starts to go at it and, and begins to teach with power, um, he becomes hated by the world. The church begins to embrace him, but the world hates him, and he's now the one being hunted and beaten and imprisoned for the gospel. He faced a lot of persecution for his faith. It can be really tough when we stand for Christ. You can pay a high price for that. Christ suggests that's going to happen. If you're really standing for Him, there are going to be people who hate you. That's another way we can suffer, right? Later in, in Paul's ministry, he, uh, he has a ministry partner named Barnabas. And they're doing stuff together. Everything's going great. And then they come to an impasse. They come to an impasse over who's going to come along with them and who's going to be mentored by them. And, and Paul wants one person and Barnabas wants somebody else. And they part ways. And uh, it can be painful when we're butting heads with fellow Christians and can't seem to get on the same page and ultimately part ways. And maybe you've had experiences like that as well. I, I think most Christians have. And it's heartbreaking at times. So, it's crazy how often it feels like ministry, which is you're going, man, this is what God has called me to do. It ends up feeling like you're pushing a boulder up a hill. And it's a good way to get crushed. It can be very challenging. So based on all of that, and then you, you know Paul's been through a lot, but then he goes into at one point um, a discussion of the thorn in his flesh. Have you heard of Paul saying, there's a thorn in my flesh that I've been wrestling with? Um, and, and a lot of people think that that is some kind of physical malady that Paul dealt with um, that left him hindered in his ministry. At least he, from his perspective, he felt hindered in this. And he wanted God to heal this or to take it away, to remove it. And instead, God told him, hey, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness, right? And... I'm sure that was not the answer Paul was looking for, right? Because he was praying, God, take this away. He wasn't praying, but Lord, your will be done. <laughs> he was, Lord, please take this away. And God said, no, that's working for you. And maybe you've had moments where God's not giving you the answer you want in the midst of your struggle or your suffering. So I say all of this to say that when Paul talks about suffering and hurt, he knows a thing or two because he's seen a thing or two. Right? Like the insurance guys. So with that established, now I want to have, invite us to look into Romans chapter 8. So if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to go to Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. And we're going to look at what Paul talks about in, in suffering. Yes, there's suffering, but there is hope even when we're hurting, even when we're struggling. And there's numerous passages that are similar to the one we're looking at today that Paul mentions. So, Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says, 
For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. So the first important truth that we encounter here is that about, about suffering is that suffering is temporary. I remember as a teenager having wild emotional swings. Did anyone else have wild emotional swings as a teenager? If you're a teenager now, you don't have to admit it. You, we'll just pretend like it's not happening, right? But, but I remember feeling like massively overwhelmed by things that in the grand scheme of things were, were really pretty silly, um, especially as you get a little m- more mature and have a little bit of perspective. You go like, okay, a C on that test is not the end of the world, but it feels like the end of the world, right? So we have things like that. And, and so in those moments, one of my mom's favorite things to say was this too shall pass. And I'm not sure if she was saying that as much to me as to herself, like eventually he's going to stop doing this. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was good for both of us. Uh, and, and, and she was right. Most of the things that we get really bent out of shape about or, or things that we feel are a big deal and are suffering, in the grand scheme of things, they will pass, right? And, and it's just a matter of getting through it. But there's often a fear that it won't pass, right? And that's what sometimes can really mess us up, is when we have that that little nagging fear that goes, what if it never gets better? And I think a lot of us feel like we could make it through things if we just knew how long we had to make it, right? If there wasn't some ambiguous maybe end date, we go, okay, I can do this. But that ambiguous maybe end date is killing us in terms of being able to persevere. And sometimes, we all know, pain can last a lifetime. That is a possibility. Here's the thing. We're going to last a lot longer than that. It's not all about this lifetime. All of us are made to be eternal beings. We are going to live forever. From the point we're born, we're going to live forever. The question about that is not if we're going to live forever, it's where (laughs) we're going to live forever. That's the absolutely critical question. And and the good news there is if you're a child of God, this is as bad as it's ever going to get. Right? This is bad. Heaven is your true home. It only gets better from here. The opposite of that is also true. If you're not saved, this is as good as it gets. And this is not that good. Right? There's plenty of struggles, plenty of suffering. And one of the topics that Jesus talks most about that often the church does not talk about is hell. Jesus warns people, hey, this is a possibility here. If you don't come to Me, This is what awaits you. Eternal separation from God and torment. It's not good. And a lot of people will question, how can a good God condemn anyone to hell? And I was reading recently, and the the author of the book I was reading is The Grace and Truth Paradox by Randy Alcorn. He said, said, the question we should be asking is, how could a good God ever allow sin into heaven? How could he do that? It doesn't even make sense. So God offers us eternity with him by faith in Jesus Christ, but you have to be made righteous through the blood of Jesus. And we receive that in faith when we put our trust in him, proclaim him to be Lord of our lives. God's not going to make anybody accept that gift. So the choice is ours. Is this going to be as good as it gets? Or is this as bad as it gets? And it's only getting better. While Paul openly admits that there is suffering in this present time, he also makes it clear that for the Christian, not only is suffering temporary, suffering is going to be ultimately replaced by glory. Replaced by glory. 
It isn't that suffering is insignificant, but that in comparison to the glory that's coming, the suffering we've endured is hardly going to be worth mentioning. I think we've all had things where we've had to wait for what seemed an unbearable amount of time, only to arrive at that moment, finally, and the wait, it it was okay. It wasn't, it wasn't really that big a deal. It wasn't as big a deal as we thought. In fact, maybe not even worth mentioning. Right? So what God is going to give us on the other side is so spectacular. I think this lifetime and the struggles that we've had here, no matter how significant they are, and some are very significant, they will feel like a momentary struggle on the other side of eternity. In other places, Paul kind of references that same idea. Uh, He refers to his struggles, even as he's in prison, as light and momentary suffering. (laughs) Light and momentary. Uh, If if you or I were in prison for a a couple years, I don't think we would be going light and momentary suffering. Right? But this is, this is Paul's perspective. And, and Paul later ends, ends up being beheaded for his faith. So he walks this out all the way to the very, very end. And I don't think even in that death that he was going, it's not worth it. I should have cashed in this a long time ago and gone another direction. He was 100% convinced he was on the right track. And as you continue to read in Romans chapter 8, Paul is excited about the glory that's coming. And, and he's, he's not alone. He says that universally creation is craving this restoration of what is right and good. Verse 19, he says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So even though suffering is often isolating, right? We tend to withdraw. You're not the only one suffering. And here Paul indicates that this is the common experience of all of creation. So an important thing to note is that suffering really is universal. Now, how we suffer, exactly what we suffer may be different in some regards, but our common experience due to the fall at the very beginning of creation, our common experience is decay, disease, and death. We're all going to face it, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, creation became corrupted. God told them the result of their sin would be decay, disease, and death. People often go, well, how can God allow all the bad things in the world? Well, most of it comes down to decay, disease, and death. So we have at creation, a man... And women were given dominion over creation, authority over creation. They were in charge to protect it, to care for it. And they brought sin into it. And all of creation became corrupted because the leaders were corrupted. So when man sinned, all of creation fell under that curse. And if you look around the world, what you'll see is that we struggle against decay, disease, and death. Right? No matter what you do, your car is going to break down and wear out. <laughs> your house is breaking down and wearing out. Now you can, you can repair it and replace it, but the natural thing is it's going to keep wearing out. Right? Your body is going to keep breaking down and wearing out. Amen. Right? I know I'm not alone on that one. It, it's frustrating, and, and we, we fight against that. We, uh, we work against it. No, but no matter how many scientific advances there are, no matter how much progress we make, man will never eradicate all disease or escape death. 
And yet that is our exact ambition. Because we know that's not the way it's supposed to be. We might do things that make us healthier, but Scripture says it is appointed to man to die once, and after that, judgment. Right? No one is going to discover another way to live eternally without Jesus. It's not going to happen. Only Christ has conquered death and swallowed up the grave in victory. Only Jesus. And He's the only way. And like the rest of creation, we long for everything to be healthy again. And while many people are trying to accomplish that on their own, only Jesus can redeem this world. He is our hope. And redemption is coming for creation, for the children of God. So when Christ returns and salvation is complete, we will finally have total freedom from sin, freedom from Satan, freedom from the curse, there will be no more decay, no more disease, no more death ever. According to Revelation 21, we'll be living in a new heaven and a new earth in new bodies. And then there's some really good news finally in all of this Revelations, or, uh, Romans passage. It gets even better. Paul says that even though that is all future, we can have the hope of heaven even when this world is suffering. We can have a home because we already have a, a taste of what is to come. We can have a hope because we already have a taste of what's to come. So let me ask you this. Did you ever grow up where if your mom was in the kitchen making something sweet that once in a while she would go, hey, does anyone want to lick the, the beater? Yeah. I loved that. Um, so if I heard the beater running, I kind of would make my way to the kitchen, see if there would be a, a beater up for grabs. But in a family with four other kids, like you had to figure out ways to distract other people so there was less competition for, for the beater, right? Um, but but I, I, I loved that when, when, uh, when mom would go, hey, does anyone want to lick the beater? And, and if you could get rid of everybody, then you got two beaters, and that was even better. Right. And I was reminded of this because yesterday as I was working on this message, I was sitting out in the front room and uh, Melissa comes walking out of the kitchen and she's holding a beater with cake batter on it. And she goes, hey, no one else is home. Do you want one of these beaters? And I was like, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I was excited. And what's funny about a beater is there's not that much cake batter on that thing. Right. I mean, really, when it comes right down to it, you lick it all off and you got a third of an ounce, you would get more cake batter with a spoonful. Like even a teaspoonful, you probably would do all right getting about as much, right? There's hardly anything on there. It's just a taste, but it's enough to make you start anticipating what's going to be coming out of the oven in a little bit, right? You go, oh, that was good. This is going to be good. And that's kind of what Paul is getting at, that same idea, when he continues Romans 8 and verse 23. He says, and not only this, but, we, uh, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and the redemption of the body. Now, when he says the first fruits, what are the first fruits? It's when you're about to have harvest and the first part that's ripe. You're going out to get that and going, okay, this is going to be a good harvest or a bad harvest? You're going to get the first and you're going to see what you got here, right? And, uh, and so it's the same idea with, with what Paul's saying about the Holy Spirit. He's saying you have been given the Spirit. So the Spirit is going to give you a foretaste, essentially a, a momentary experience, a little bit of a, a foreshadowing of what's going to come in heaven. You're going to get a little glimpse of it by the Holy Spirit indwelling you and being at work in you. So when Christ promised that He would send His Holy Spirit to live in us, to guide us into truth, to make us one with Him, we're getting this little taste of what heaven will be like. It's a small taste. 
With salvation, we're born again. Or we're made new, in a sense. But not in the finished sense. Right? Like a resurrected body. We're, we're getting there. When we're adopted, it talks about us being adopted as sons and daughters, but not fully adopted until His kingdom comes. But this little taste of the Spirit in us gives us great hope. And we, we, we draw close to God in those moments when we experience the presence of God. When we get a sense that God is speaking to us, right? You go, ooh, I feel Him. I, I, I sense Him. He's near. He's in me. When we feel the weight of our sin lifted, that's a Holy Spirit moment. When we get a little experience of His love and His peace washing over us in just the moment we need it. It's a little taste. We get a glimpse of so much more that's coming ahead and we struggle to see it clearly, right? Because we don't know exactly what it's going to be like. We have a, a hazy image, right? We know it's kind of like this earth but no death, no disease, no decay, no corruption. But having that little glimpse gives us hope for what is yet to come. In verse 24, Paul continues, he says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. So we don't have heaven yet, right? Not here. If we hadn't, we wouldn't, if we had it, we would not be hoping for it. We'd be looking at it. But one day, it will be a reality for those who have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and trusted in His death and resurrection to pay the debt of their sin. And the promise of eternity with Christ is one where there is no decay no disease, no death, no sin. And it's hard for us to imagine such a place because we are so accustomed to those things, right? We intuitively don't trust people. Why? Because sin's a reality, right? But there is a place where there is only peace, no war. A place where there is joy, no sorrow. A place without corruption, without pollution, without jealousy, without competition, without anger. There could not be a better place to explore all of who God is and all of what heaven is and all of what relationships are meant to be than heaven. It is an incredible thing. A place where the lion lays down with the lamb. A place where the little child can play with any and every animal, even a venomous animal. A place where everyone is a friend and no one is an enemy. A place where everyone is redeemed. We're all going to go through difficult things in life. But there is a hope found in one person, Jesus Christ. And when we know that better is coming, which is what He promises us, which is what He guarantees by the Holy Spirit in us, we most certainly can endure with hope. We can endure with hope. When Paul wrote to Titus, I want to close with this scripture, he, he was encouraging Titus in these same things. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Paul wrote this. He said, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope. What is that hope? And the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself up for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions, 
possession, zealous for good deeds. Christ has showed up. He's going to show up again, and He's going to show up to redeem us all that we would be adopted as His. Heirs. So the coming return of Christ gives hope to the Christian no matter what struggles we're facing. It's not to diminish those struggles, but to say there will be an end date. (laughs) There will be an end date. You can make it. Hold fast. Don't give up. No matter what struggles you're facing, everything is going to be set right. So I would just say to that, if you are not saved, today can be your day of salvation. Today can be the day you put your hope in Christ. Today can be the day you receive the Holy Spirit to live inside of you, giving you that first glimpse of the Holy Spirit that's to come and what's all to come. So I want to ask you this. This is what it's going to look like. If, you, if, this, if this is your moment to... to become a Christian, to follow Jesus. The first question is, are you willing to admit your desire to rule your own life, which ultimately is sin? Can can you admit that? Are you willing to confess Jesus as Lord? Will you put your trust in Christ's sacrifice for your sin, and will you commit to following Jesus? Sometimes we make it a lot more complicated than it has to be. But really it comes down to Just going, all right, I do want Jesus on the throne of my life and I'm going to follow Him. My way doesn't work. And if you haven't figured that out yet, I pray to God you will soon. Because following Him is the only way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So those are the basics. And if you want to pray a prayer today, I would love to pray with you. Nick would love to pray with you. Probably three-fourths of the people in this room, maybe 95% would be happy to pray with you to, uh, to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Um, if you're already good there, then be prepared to give a reason for the hope you have. Right? We should all be ready to share the reason for the hope we have, because we have a hope that others cannot get unless they come to Christ. Why don't you stand on your feet and let's pray it out of here. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hope that you do offer to us. That you would be so kind and so gracious. Scripture says that, you know, who would die for a, an evil person? You, know, you You did. Even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. So Lord, I pray that, that we would have a gratitude towards you. And Lord, in the midst of whatever struggles we're facing, Lord, that we too would be able to see that your grace is sufficient, that your power is made perfect in our weakness, and that we have a hope of something so much greater than the sufferings of this life. And Lord, we know that even in those sufferings. Sometimes you're going to just walk through them with us, but sometimes you're going to move in magnificent ways for your glory. And so, Lord, we we trust that, that you know exactly when that is and you will move and that we will be given opportunities to praise you for the powerful works of your hand. Lord, I pray that, that salvation would be on our hearts. Um, Lord, that, that the hope of heaven would be you know, at the forefront of our minds and that we'd be ready to share the reason for the hope we have, which is you. So Lord, just uh, use us, move in us, and uh, allow us to reach others for your kingdom. And we pray it all in Jesus' name.